thank you for coming. Uh, this talk is about Chinese surveillance and cloud pets. Um, and I'm the CEO of 70 Security. If you like this talk, uh, there's some public pentest reports here. This is other stuff I've learned in other companies and other um, courses I've written for practical web defense about hacking and defending uh, web applications. I'm also the OWASP OWTF uh, project leader, one of them. Uh, there's some presentations here, and I also delivered, uh, I also have like a number of security certifications and stuff um, that I can talk about uh, over some years about how that happens, if you're interested. So in this talk, we're going to cover part of the last three Pentest reports here about um, uh, Chinese police apps, uh, more about surveillance and stuff, as I'll cover later. And the first two are more about uh, mobile security, about what you should never do when uh, you write a mobile application. You can see that pretty much here. There's almost every mistake possible was done. So very good for uh, learning about that. And there's other reports there as well, if you're interested. Uh, so today, we're going to talk about uh, cloud pets uh, and then a couple of uh, Chinese police apps, right? So let's take a look at this. So cloud pets, uh, the best way to explain this is for you to, um, to watch the demo. So um, in here, you will basically see, uh, you know, what the vendor says about this, and it's it just makes it easier to understand how the whole process works. This is another demo. Uh, so essentially what happens is the parent is far from home, and they send messages to the child uh, using a mobile app, right? So the idea is that the parent somehow feels close to the child and the other way around. Uh, the child receives this message, uh, these messages that the parent sends through the soft toy, and then the child can send the messages, uh, can send messages back to the parent using the soft toy, and the parent receives the messages on the mobile app, right? So that is the basic idea. And the way it works is that the toy uses Bluetooth uh, low energy to communicate with the mobile app. So the, um, the toy has Bluetooth, it has a microphone, and it has a speaker, right? Because it needs to play the message from the parent. Uh, and the mobile app on the parent phone is away from the toy. It sends and receives messages to from uh, CloudPad servers at the beginning, and then Amazon S3 later. Uh, and then uh, the mobile app on the child device is close to the toy. So it sends and receives messages to and um, from the servers and uploads and downloads messages to and from the toy using Bluetooth low energy. So that is the main way in which uh, this was working. So uh, just pause this for a minute and try to think what could go wrong with this. And yeah, so basically, um, the first thing that happened was that the Mongo database, where all the data was, uh, was exposed without authentication on the internet. So uh, unauthorized parties downloaded the database. They got three ransom requests. It was indexed by Shodan, um, pretty much 1 million users at risk. And the company that developed this uh, claimed to never have found evidence of any breach, uh, despite all these um, documented stuff. This is a screenshot from uh, the public database. Um, and yeah, and then there were like password hashes, emails, links to all voice recordings from child, children and parents and all this. So you can see a write up on this on Trihan's uh, blog. Um, so this is the first ransom, right? And there was, uh, they basically got a message like this. It was on Pastebin, on Twitter. Uh, so the initial timeline is like multiple security researchers alert uh, cloud pets uh, through multiple means, right? During these uh, dates. And then after, so the company did nothing, right? And then after this, uh, they got the first ransom. So the original databases were deleted and a ransom demand left on the system using a please read message. Then uh, two more ransoms afterwards uh, for the same thing. And then on the 13th of January, uh, no databases were found to be publicly accessible anymore. So let's talk about, uh, that's about the server security or lack of it. And now let's talk about the toy security, right? So um, the charts here was led by Paul Stone. So you can read his research on, on this uh, blog post. 
And basically he concluded that the toy has no uh, built-in Bluetooth security features, no authentication for bonding or pairing between the device and the phone. Anyone can connect to the toy as long as it is switched on. So this is very scary because if somebody's on the street, they can tell the child, for example, to open the door or stuff like that. So it's, it's quite bad. Uh, and then for upgrades, uh, the firmware is unencrypted and upgrades only use uh, a weak checksum for validation, which is not, uh, which is not safe. And it's possible to remotely modify the toy's firmware as well, right? So uh, overall, pretty bad. And yeah, you can watch a demo here uh, explaining uh, all these weaknesses. So after all this, uh, of course, Paul Stone also contacted the um, Spiral Toys, the company behind this. Um, so there were multiple write-ups about the lack of security of the toy, the lack of use of built-in security features, all attempts to warn Spiral Tools failed. And then the company uh, confirms that they did not reply to the data breach emails and rather decided to fix them, right? So that is what uh, they said. So the question is, what did they fix? Uh, Mozilla, who sponsored the uh, audit that I'm going to talk about now, uh, was basically asking, are the toys safe now, right? Because they are saying um, they fixed everything. So uh, let's check, right? So this is where our actual work begins. Uh, since I was on this one with Jesper, I decided to add some kind of Viking uh, motif. So this is the proper historical Viking helmet, and this is the fun one. But yeah, we just uh, in honor of him. I decided to do this little tribute to um, how I like biking stuff. Uh, so yeah, he looked more at the firmware stuff of the unicorn toy. So he was looking more uh, at the firmware and try to find problems on that. And um, yeah, this is uh, my my lab actually. Um, but yeah, what could possibly go wrong, right? So the first thing we found was that the CloudPets app directs users to a clear text HTTP domain. The domain is currently on sale, so anybody can purchase the domain and influence users, right? So this is bad. I mean, it's bad already that it uses clear text HTTP, but it's even worse that the domain is for sale because anybody can buy it and just get, uh, you know, uh, for example, from users for credentials on this page and, and can take over accounts and stuff, right? So it prompts, uh, for example, you could prompt users for credentials or you could prompt users to download malicious apps, right? So just a couple of examples. The page is requested over clear text HTTP, so anybody on a public Wi-Fi could uh, potentially change that uh, and replace it with anything else. So uh, this is bad, right? And yeah, and basically the same thread, like you could ask for credentials you could from the users to download malicious apps uh, and all that stuff. Um, so this is how it looked like in practice. Uh, we have uh, the app here, and then you uh, click here for help, and then you get uh, that this domain is for sale. So this is basically what you will see uh, on the phone. Uh, and then uh, other issues are that uh, Polestone's public proof of concept remains uh, working without any changes. So basically, you can navigate with your phone here and just play with the toy without any modification to the proof of concept, uh, proving that absolutely nothing has been fixed, right? So you can push on, uh, you can, for example, a stranger can connect to the toy without authentication. So somebody walking on the street, you can push audio and play it on the toy. So you can, for example, uh, make the toy say, open the door, uh, I'm your friend, whatever, uh, to a child. And then if the child opens the door, uh, the thief is in, for example, right? Uh, and you can download audio from the toy. So you can use the toy as a spy device to see what's going on wherever uh, the toy is. So it's pretty scary stuff, right? Then other issues, uh, no firmware protections in place. So basically uh, the same problem with firmware verification remains. Uh, uh, the firmware is installed uh, using Bluetooth low energy, but the installation process still has no verification. There's no sing signature or integrity checks in place. So the only protection is just a checksum. So it's uh, not safe. Um, and then uh, another problem is that the CloudPets uh, voice recordings are world readable, right? So it's all saved on an S3 bucket. 
but uh, there's no authentication or anything. So if you know the URL, you can dump it and the bucket is also not uh, very well configured. So it's all pretty bad. Um, so in summary, uh, cloud storage can store and replay voice messages. Uh, they expose personal information of more than uh, 8,000 customers, 800,000 customers, and effectively turn the toys into potential uh, spy devices. Uh, Mozilla asked for a retest of the issues, and we found that uh, they didn't fix much other than the MongoDB without authentication, right? Uh, now the toys, uh, thanks to Mozilla, are now removed from Amazon, Walmart, and all the other shops, uh, because after the retest, nothing, it was found they fixed nothing, so it was basically shut down. I think they are bankrupt now. So with this, we finished a little bit, so let's talk about uh, the Chinese police apps, right? So. Here I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of uh, apps that the Chinese government uses. On um, These are called iJob and BXAQ. Uh, so they are used to evaluate the threat level of their minority Muslim population in Xinjiang, right? which is a Chinese uh, section, uh, an area in China where there's more uh, people that are Muslim for some reason. right? And you can read about these here. So basically, Human Rights Watch uh, requested a project funded by the Open Technology Fund to report and document the findings of the apps, right? To investigate the potential violation of human rights, right? That this was the goal. So this is not um, a security test like the previous one. This is more about uh, what data they collecting uh, and all that kind of stuff. So here we were trying to answer the questions from the human rights activists, right? So. The main question is, is the system of systems iJob uh, potentially compromising the human rights of a minority Chinese population, right? So that's the main thing. Um, <clears throat> so the Integrated Joints Operation Platform, or iJob, is a policing program based on big data analysis, and the program uh, aggregates data about people. Often without their knowledge, it flags data it deems potentially threatening to officials and yeah, you can read more uh, about this here because I'm not really into the politics. I'm more, we were basically just answering the question that the human rights activists uh, had based on the technical evidence we found on the application, right? So to understand the political background of this, about what's going on and the social background, you can just watch uh, this demo and it's, uh, the human rights activists will explain it better than me. So with this, uh, let's start talking about the apps themselves, right? So um, the iJob was originally developed by China Electronics Technology Group Corporation. It's a state-owned military contractor. The company was set up in 2017 as a research center. And they are pra uh, primarily focused on areas such as artificial intelligence, mapping, and big data. So, the first problem we had, of course, is we spoke no Chinese, so we had to translate the app, right? So basically what you do here, you decompile the APK and then translate the strings of XML with Google Translate or similar, and then recompile the APK, and you got an APK in English, more or less. It's kind of broken English, but it's good enough um, to figure out what the application is doing, right? So APK tool, excellent for this kind of stuff. Another thing that we did was to set up Tor. So just to try to be a little bit more stealthy uh, in case anything was, uh, you know, like the app was sending anything uh, back to their Chinese servers or something, we just set up Tor and tunnel the traffic through Tor. So there's not going to be uh, any problem while we can still inspect the traffic uh, without leaking our, our own IPs as testers, right? So that was uh, what we did. And then another problem we had is what is after the login, right? Because we have the apps, but we don't have credentials to log in on these police servers. So we cannot log in and we don't know how politically bad the information on the screen is. So we had to uh, hack the application so that it would let us uh, see all the screens of the system without being logged in. And with this, uh, we would be able to answer the questions from the human rights activists, right? So. We modify the app to export all activities and provide a tweak build to the activists to access all the activities and then provide a list of ADB commands to activists to see the activities. So basically, 
things that they could put on the command line so that different uh, screens of the app would be launched and then they could like inspect the screens themselves because the human it's the human right activist and not as the pen testers who really know if something is good or bad and knew uh, Chinese as well, right? So we gave them the broken English and the Chinese, uh, proper Chinese version, both with the, all activities exported so that they could review and decide what is bad and what is not bad, right? So activists can now run a script to review uh, after logging screens quickly, even though we don't have credentials to log in on the system, right? So let's talk about what we found. So there was, for example, collection of blood type and political views. So the question was as follows, recording of height and blood type, we want to know to what extent the authorities can justify this by saying this is all for counterterrorism. So far, I see only a few mentions of terrorism, right? So we had to answer questions like this, right? So. My job, uh, my job app indulges in data collection, likely for anomaly detection. Uh, it is assumed that the goal of this data collection is to have more reference data, namely to mine and gather data on individuals with increases, increasingly strong indicators. Um, data that does not match the information from the headquarters may reveal more suspicious and problematic subsets of users, actual people and groups, right? So that is, uh, if you take like ethics and privacy and all these out, uh, this makes sense for a government in that to catch terrorism, you want to look for anomalies, right? So this is what they seem to be doing. Uh, of course, there's kind of a privacy problem there with the government having all this information. But from the pragmatic uh, idea of catching the terrorists, uh, depending on your principles, uh, it kind of makes some sense, right? That they're trying to. Uh, so this is some evidence about gathering the height and the blood type uh, of the people. This is the application gathering the, the data, right? So height, blood type, political look. Uh, so there's information like that being gathered. Um, and then another interesting thing was they collect information about the electricity consumption, right? So why, why are they collecting information about electricity consumption? So this is um, uh, this is the take from Human Rights Watch. So it is problematic because the authorities are logging everyone's electricity use. They are trying to see if there's a reason for abnormal level of electricity use, and the application employs a database with which fetches various utility data about an individual. Right. So uh, again, from a privacy perspective, this is bad. But if you try to catch uh, terrorists or something funny going on, if somebody is using 10 times more electricity than other people, uh, then maybe something is going, going on and maybe this is why they are doing this, right? So this is speculation. So um, yeah, the app receives electricity consumption data from the headquarters. A police officer receives a new task. And then the police officer can file a report to investigate uh, the occurrence of unusual uh, power consumption, right? So if something, somebody is using too much electricity, they can go there and check what's going on. Uh, so they can do so at any given date and mark any reasons for the same, which prepares the ground for further investigation by the public security agency. Now, in case of a false positive, the officer can file in the actual electricity meter value uh, and a justification by law enforcement might be to monitor the use of electricity for cryptocurrency mining, growing cannabis indoors, or maybe uh, other reasons, right? So these types of activities can lead to increased uh, consumption. And this is uh, what it looked like in the broken English uh, app, right? So you can see they are pretty much gathering uh, all that information. So here there's an ethical Question, right? Like, what do you think? Like, should the government be able to monitor how much electricity everybody uses? Is this a privacy intrusion? And can this stop terrorist attacks? Right. So this is kind of the balance you need to strike. And, and depending on where you live, uh, you might uh, think in one way or another. Right. And it's all <laughs> a fine balance to work. Right. Because on one hand, you want to catch the terrorist, but I'm not sure if the terrorists are going to use. Uh, too much electricity or not. So 
uh, at the same time you're gathering a lot of information about citizens so it's uh, you know something to think about it's not um, an easy thing to answer right uh, now reporting feature for problematic tools uh, they had doubts about the tools, specifically the tools they use and possess. An option under electronic appears to refer to problematic tools. Uh, this includes tools that may be implemented to make explosives, right? So maybe that makes more sense to stop terrorism. I'm not sure. Uh, so officers can submit a report to the headquarters about explosive materials and tools. An officer can ask for investigation of the matter, and this investigation can be further handed over and carried on by the public security agency, right? So this is how this looked like. Um, yeah, so uh, what you have to bear in mind is that the iJob is much more than the app itself. So this is all, like it, this all fits into the central system that they have and they uh, use with big data and all this. So this is correlated, right? So the iJob app is the app that police officers use and, and they, that they use to gather information and stuff, but then this is correlated with the CCTV cameras with facial recognition and night vision, so they know where everybody is at uh, any point in time as soon as, soon as a, ca a camera catches them. Then there's Wi-Fi sniffers that track computers, smartphones, and other network devices to see, for example, what they are, what kind of SSIDs they are probing and stuff. They correlate all these data as well. And then they also check like license plate numbers, citizen ID card, card numbers, and stuff like this. Of course, um, vehicle uh, ownership, health insurance, family planning, banking, and legal records, right? So there's all these, all this information goes into a central database and they correlate all this, right? So a few checks on police surveillance powers. Uh, no effective privacy about uh, against government intrusions in China, and China has no unified privacy or data protection law to protect uh, personally identifying information from misuse, right? So they are really not breaking any laws because they make the laws and that's how they roll. Uh, but from a European or US perspective, uh, this is kind of viewed in a different light. Right? So there's always these cultural differences. Uh, let's call them that, right? Uh, there is very little information ab available about how securely the data is collected. Uh, the data collected by this system is stored, and there's no formal system for people to find out what information is being held about them in IJOB, right? So for a comparison in Europe, uh, any individual can request a company to delete all the personal information from the database, and the company has to do it, right? As long as uh, there's no uh, a law requirement for it, right? So yeah, very different laws than in Europe. And this is how the Wi-Fi uh, scanners uh, right, right? So when you walk through the underground or something, there's Wi-Fi scanners everywhere and they uh, get all that. So it is unclear how the iJob and police cloud are related. It's unclear uh, if and how uh, the iJob connects to other databases on people. Uh, yeah, and it's capable of collecting and managing uh, a lot of information on very specific data, right? So the application has a tracking power over uh, energy consumption and the recording of political views and the religious uh, atmosphere, right? So yeah, this is all like a, a fine line, right? So the review was fa uh, was carried out in close collaboration with the Human Rights, uh, Rights Watch team. And at the same time, it should be noted that we operated uh, purely as a technically dri driven team and unbiased uh, investigating entity, right? So all the ethics and the, you know, what is right and what is wrong and all that, we didn't really get into that. We were only answering questions from Human Rights Watch, right? So they had some questions and we technically tried to answer them, but that's pretty much it, right? So we worked on a premise of technical evidence based on reverse engineering operations. So yeah, and this is, um, this is a picture uh, about all this. So now let's take a look at a different kind of app, right? So the other app is an app that police officers would have like to fill out information and collect information about users, like filling out forms. And this is uh, a different app. The BXAQ is more about uh, you cross the border and then they install this app on your phone and then they grab all the contacts, all the information on the phone, and then they upload it to some police service. Right, so this is a bit different in that they are actually installing an app on the phone to extract all the information uh, from the phone that they want. 
So this is used uh, in specific regions of China by law enforcement personnel and has the potential to gather a mass and manage massive amount of data about a specific, right? So this is a quick demo about this. Uh, yeah, and I think I'm pretty much over if we take into account the time of the demo. So basically, um, we reversed the app uh, and we looked at what kind of information was uh, being collected. So I'm going to skip over this, but it basically collected, this is the data collector, right? By calendar entries, phone contacts, country codes, dial numbers, uh, all the identifiers uh, of the device, uh, the Android model, text messages sent and received. Uh, so yeah, so pretty much is an app that they installed and gather all the information from the phone uh, and download, right? And this I will have to skip over so you have time to watch the demos. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty much uh, it's pretty much that, right? So uh, so yeah, two applications, uh, iDrop and BXAQ. One, the police use it uh, to fill out forms and stuff, and BXAQ uh, they use it to store it on the phone and get the data from there. So for Human Rights Watch, these uh, raised concerns uh, and their reports produced reflected uh, highly on the loopholes in all of the systems. Uh, but yeah, we were uh, like technically driven and just trying to answer questions, right? So we didn't get into uh, the politics and stuff. So with this, if you have any questions, since this is recorded, you can uh, shoot me an email and I'll do my best to answer. Uh, and that's it. And if you are interested in playing with these apps, these are part of our mobile course. So uh, any uh, cyber security student attending a mobile course uh, will get access to all these apps to play with. Uh, and I hope I hope this helps. And thank you for joining us.